serving the Lord for many years, they have not developed their Christian walk. And I believe God wants us to be strong in Him. Today, walking with Jesus. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, it tells us, He who walks in the midst of the church, in the midst of the golden uh, lampstands. Uh, later, in, in this book of Revelation, Jesus told John, they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. The Lord is talking about believers. This is a pro prophetic vision that was given to John. And John, when he sees Jesus, he sees Jesus in the church. I need to tell you today that Jesus is walking in the midst of the church. He's, he's with you right now. Yes, amen. He does not forsake you. You ought to be praising the Lord for that. In your, in your new life with the Lord, you need to know that the Lord is walking with you daily. He's with you right now. He will not forsake you. I hear the Lord say, I will never, never, never forsake you. I believe it, friends. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Our new life in Christ is essentially a daily fellowship with Him. I don't know your routine through the week, but we, we as children of God are, are blessed with this, this fellowship that we have with Jesus Christ. Amen. What is it like walking with the Lord? What is it like abiding in the fellowship of Jesus Christ? Walking with Jesus produces a progressive change in our hearts and in our lives. When I thought about uh, walking with the Lord, I thought about Moses walking up Mount Sinai into the presence of God. And it, it seemed to me to be a continual and a gradual progression of change that took place in Moses. The first time that Moses came into the presence of the Lord at the burning bush, you remember that there was, there was this change of direction in his life and an assignment for him. Later when Moses came back to Sinai, he, he came up into the presence of God. And in those times that he was in the presence of God, first of all, we see a change that takes place on his countenance. And Moses became as, as a voice of God to the people of God. I believe that as we walk with God, there's going to be some changes that take place in our lives. Abiding in the presence of God will bring a radical change upon our, our life. I believe that it will be just as radical as the change that took place in Moses' life, if not more so. In the book of Amos, the Old Testament prophet asked a question that we should consider Amos chapter three and verse three. It says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? I think that's relative to your walk with God. Can you really walk with God if you are not in agreement with him? 
Can you walk with Jesus Christ if you are not truly in fellowship with him? In the early days of Christ's first advent, when he walked here on earth, Jesus asked people to follow him. In the book of Mark, chapter 1 and verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, and they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. Verse 19. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the heart servants and went after Jesus. You know, it, it's a, a story that many of us have seen throughout our lives of looking into the word about the disciples and their introduction into Christ. As the disciples responded and followed the Lord, they began a journey that that revealed who Jesus really was in his great glory and in his power. It's, it's interesting to me that following the, the text here and the story, not only here, but also in the other gospels, that as soon as Jesus had called them, he led them to a, a, a temple and a synagogue, and there he, he began to minister. And as Jesus was ministering, something very unique happened. Jesus told them who he was, what he was here to do. In chapter 4, verse 18 of the book of Luke, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Immediately after calling Simon, Andrew, James, and John, Jesus went into the synagogue and began teaching. These words are going to be fulfilled and they are going to see Jesus revealed in this manner. While Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit cried out. He said, I'll pause a second. Do you see that people with an unclean spirit can go to church? The man with an unclean spirit cried out, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I, I, I need to pause again. Satan knows who Jesus is. Right. It's interesting that a lot of people who go to church don't know who Jesus is. These followers of Christ were immediately impressed with the power and the glory of the Lord. For Jesus spoke to the unclean spirit that was in the man and cast him out. And the, the spirit responded and came out of the man immediately. Yeah, hallelujah. Some people struggle to try to cast out evil spirits or even to overcome evil in their life. But Jesus Christ has the power and the glory and the authority to speak to evil and it must respond. Amen. Walking with Jesus exposed these new believers, these new followers of Christ, these who were walking with Jesus in a new life with Jesus Christ. They were immediately uh, forced to understand and see that Jesus is not like any other man. He is indeed the Son of God. Amen. The disciples quickly were initiated into this new life. Jesus was walking in great power and authority. The disciples began to see something in Jesus that they could not see in anyone else. I want you to pay close attention to what happened. Jesus did this as he walked on the earth. 
As they walked with him, they witnessed his power over Satan, his power over sin, his power over death, and his power over sickness. That is the Lord's statement of, of, of ministry. This is why I came, is to do these things. When you start your new life in Christ, you should expect your situation to radically change as you're walking with the Lord. Isaiah the prophet was given great insight into the change that occurs as we identify with Christ and walk with him. Isaiah 43 and verse 1 now. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you. I want you to listen to what God has planned for those who follow him. He's speaking here to Jacob. We've read this verse quite frequently for some reason recently. He says, oh, Jacob, he formed you, O Israel. He says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name and you are mine. Let me stop again and ask you, do you realize that the Lord has called you out of the world, that he has called you out of sin, that he has called you out of a life of unproductive living, that he has called you unto himself. He said, I have called you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. And then he says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they shall not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. We're looking at the benefits of walking with Jesus Christ. Isaiah was describing the relationship of the redeemed that they have with the Lord. He said, God has formed you. He has created you and he has given you life. You need to see this in your life, that you're not here by accident, that God is with you and that he has brought you to this moment in time because he is your Lord and Savior. Yeah. You know, that should change the way that we look at ourselves, should change the way that we look at life in general. We know that the Lord has called us. He's claimed us. You, you belong to him. And then he encourages us to walk with him without fear for God has redeemed you. This verse of scripture should be one that encourages you with everything that you face in your life. He knows you by name. He's called you. He's summoned you. He's identified himself with you. He says you are mine. Friend, you need, to, you need to start claiming this as a word for your life. The Lord knows who you are. He says, I have claimed you. When you go through the difficult situations in your life, you can say, I know I'm going to be able to make it because the Lord is with me. Amen. Isaiah said that no situation in life would hinder the Savior's success. I see it very clearly here. If you're facing any kind of fear, any kind of thing that would bring normal fear to people, you need to know that God has, has isolated you and he has claimed you. I see, I see in that the Lord putting a shield of protection around us. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go through the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It doesn't mean that you're not going to walk through the waters, the children of Israel. It doesn't mean that you're not going to face some difficult such circumstance and situation, but the Lord your God is going to be with you. He will protect you and he will keep you. So when flooding rivers rise and they seem to bring normal fear and concern, have you noticed, dear one, have you paid any attention to the fact that you survived? You know, you look back in your life and there are things I can attest to it myself. There are things that should have destroyed us, but the Lord our God was with us and he was keeping us. I love walking with the Lord because when everybody else is swept away, we are held firm because of the Lord's care. Amen. How can this happen? It can happen in your new life in Christ because you are walking with God, your Savior. Verse number 10 
God says, you are my witnesses and my servant whom I have called so that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And apart from me, there is no Savior. This is a personal message for everyone who is walking with the Lord and have put their trust in Him. Amen. I, I think that it would be good for every one of us to have one of those Selah, Paul's moments when we think about what the Word of God is telling us. You have been set aside by God Almighty to be His witnesses, testimonies of His glory and of His strength. You know, God is not going to forsake His testimony and He's placed His name in you. He's placed His title upon you. He said, I have claimed you in your mind. Not only has God identified us with His Son, we can personally identify Ourself with him as our Savior and our Lord. I look back, you look back, and you see the waters, you see the rising floods, you see the fire of persecution and of difficulties, and through it all, we can say, look what the Lord has done. I have a testimony today of what God has done in my life. Yeah. See, God wants to demonstrate who he is. And what he is able to do through you. You know what that means. He's put his name, his character, and his reputation on the line with every one of you. So everything that you go through is a testimony. You know, I look back at the children of Israel. How they walked through the Red Sea. How, how God provided a way where there seemed to be no way. How they made it through the wilderness. It, it, it should have been impossible. But God made a way where there was no way. He said he was their defense. God said he would be a wall of fire around them. And then God said that he bore them up on eagles' wings and he carried them along. There are times in your life you can't really explain it. You don't understand how you got through, but it was because the arms of the Lord were underneath. He was carrying you along when it seemed like there was no way that you could make it. God made a way for you to make it. Jesus chose his disciples to bear witness of his actions. They were chosen to be witnesses of the truth. They not only saw his glory, they also were called to fellowship with the Lord of glory. Now there's uh, different levels of fellowship and different levels of knowing. As the disciples walked with Jesus, they were exposed to many challenging situations. Throughout the journey with the Lord, His glory was shown in signs and wonders and, and great miracles. There were times Jesus commissioned them and He told them, You go out, you heal the sick, you raise the dead, you cleanse the leper. You, know, you think about that just a moment. If the Lord gave you that assignment today, you go out and do this in my name. I, I feel sometimes it's a daunting task what the Lord has asked of us as people who are walking with him. As Jesus was walking with them or they were walking with Jesus, a great multitude of people were following the Lord because they saw the miraculous signs and the things that Jesus did. There were times in those multitudes of people that the scripture says he healed all of their sick. He delivered everyone who was oppressed by the devil. Jesus, in this one instant in the book of John chapter 6, he turned to Philip and he asked Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? The text says Jesus was testing Philip for he already knew what he was going to do. I, I see the same thing in our life, in your life. 
Sometimes you don't know the answer for the dilemma that is before you. And God says, will you trust me? And I think sometimes we come to these difficult moments because God wants to see how we are going to respond in faith or in doubt. It sounds really absurd to me that Peter said, we found a young boy that has five barley loaves and two fish. Then he said, what would this be with a multitude like this? I, I, I think about it and it's really absurd to think that a multitude over 5,000 men plus the women and children. Now, you can tell real quickly in a society where children are, most families would have five, ten children or more. Uh, you're looking at a great multitude of people. What are two small fish and five barley loaves among so many? And Jesus told the disciples, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have everybody set down and so the disciples had the 5,000 plus the, the women and children set down on the grass. And John 6 and 11, Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them, to the disciples and the disciples to those setting down and likewise of the fish. And this last phrase is one that may seem like it was dropped in there, but it's really I think the most important phrase they were to be able to give them as much as they wanted. Now think about that just a moment. Would you please? If I only had two fish and five biscuits and 5,000 people to, to make the statement, give them as much as they want. I know I have watched some of you around banquet tables. I know that five, two small fish and five barley loaves would not feed you, much less 5,000 people. But Jesus knew what he was doing. And Jesus is raising up a testimony. He's saying to his disciples, you need to expect the unexpected. You need to believe that God is able to do what you are not able to do. That when your resources are too small, too small. When you're running short, that God is able to make a way where there seems to be no way. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Verse 12, the next verse is really important. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain. Gather up the leftovers so that nothing is lost. Now, I, I my mind is probably different than other people's mind, but I, I see five barley loaves and two fishes and 5,000 men plus the women and children, and I'm thinking leftovers. But the disciples went, and verse 13, it says, therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Think about it just a moment. The disciples gathered up more than they started with. I don't know what God is going to do in your life, but I can tell you this. He is not limited by your resources. He's not limited by the things that you have and hold in your hands. He's able to do great things. Everyone present in that meeting knew something great happened. It was a testimony of those or for those that were walking with the Lord. After feeding the people, Jesus had the disciples get in a boat. You know the story. And he told them to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And then Jesus was going to send the multitudes away. Verse number 23 of Matthew 14. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. 
I want you to remember the words from Isaiah because it's very pertinent to this. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Jesus wanted his disciples to have faith that even if the waves came up and the winds started blowing, that the Lord would not forsake them. You, you may not see him. And I think this is probably in our lives a challenge. We see the floods. We see the waters. We see the fire. We see the difficulties all around us. And sometimes in the midst of it all, we wonder, where is the Lord? He sent us. He's, he said that we could go to the other side. We're doing this at his bidding. Do you realize in your life that you're walking with God? That you are walking with the Lord? Do you realize that you are called by him? He has claimed you. He said you are his. You know, if, if he has claimed you, if he has said you are his, you need, to, you need to reckon this to be true, that you're going to make it when the floods of adversity come. You're going to make it when the fires of the enemy come against you because the Lord will not forsake you. Amen. Now, it seemed like it was at the darkest moment in their test. I, I need to notify you that as you're walking with the Lord, there's going to be some moments in your life that you're going to say, where is Jesus? Where is the Lord when I need him? You're going to question, why is it dark out? Why are there so many waves? You may even be saying, we're going to die in this storm. And that's when Jesus came walking on the water. They were afraid when they saw him. They were troubled. But Jesus said, be of good cheer in his eye. Do not be afraid. It was at that moment that Simon Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you. And what does that mean? It means command me to walk out there to you. Now, I, I, I'm a little more cautious kind of person. I would probably would have stayed in the boat with the others. But Peter said, Lord, if it's you, command me to walk with you. You know, there's something about walking with Jesus that sometimes it's a personal challenge to us to walk where Jesus walks. To do what he's called us to to do. You see, his steps are pure. His steps are holy. His steps are righteous. His steps are full of the power of the Spirit of God. His steps are different from our steps. And when he calls us to come and walk with him, friends, you need to understand you may, you may be walking in some places that you never thought you could walk before. Right. Most of us do not have a complete understanding of what God is doing in our lives. You may be looking at a routine trip out to the lake, but the Lord wants you to see his glory and his power. You may be walking down a country road or driving out in the country just to see what's going on, but Jesus wants to show you his miracle provision. You may, you may not understand the situation that you're going through. The disciples' faith wavered during that dark moment on the sea. Most of us have those moments in our walk with the Lord where the storm has challenged us, where we don't know, are we going to be able to make it? You might even be running the thought through your mind, who should I send my will in last testament to? But the Lord says, you will not drown. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to provide a way for you so that you can make it in this difficult moment. You see, they were walking with the king of glory, the one who raised the dead, the one who opened blinded eyes, the one who healed the, the withered hand. But they were with the one and they were participants of his glory and of his power. If you walk on the water with Jesus, 
You're going to be brought into a deeper connection with God. You see, walking with Him, and let me tell you, you may never have intended to walk on water with the Lord. But if you keep walking with him, you're going to be pulled into a depth of power that you will know that the Lord is is the one who has made it possible for me to make it through these steps that I'm going through. Every impossibility is an opportunity for another miracle of God in your life. Peter's success depended fully upon him keeping his eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and walking where Jesus walked. Friends, in your life, you're going to have to do the same thing. You're not going to be able to make it where God has called you and with what you're going to face if you do not keep your eyes on the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I do believe the Lord has not called us to weakness, but he's called us to strength. He's called us to success. He's called us to the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why God has said, you are my witnesses. In other words, I put my name on you. It, it's, it's like the Lord has tattooed his name across your forehead. Right. And he says, this one belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It may not be visible sign but it is the glory of God that is upon you you, you will notice this from time to time I, I have noticed it many times you used to I, I used to play golf uh, some I don't play I haven't played golf in several years now but I remember when I would go out and play golf with guys and they I would go out by myself and they would put me with some some guys that were drinking and all kinds of other stuff on the golf course. And I, I remember many, I wouldn't tell them that I was a preacher, but after a while they would come up to me and they'd say, you're a preacher, aren't you? Huh. And I'd say, yeah, I'm a preacher. You know, there's something about you that is so different from the people in the world that your testimony is going to come out. People are going to see that you are people of the presence of God. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, here's what the Lord is preparing you for. You see, it's not just about this life. It's about what he's preparing you for. God is preparing a people for the presence of God for eternity. Revelation 1 and verse 5. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God, his father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. We want to walk in his love. We want to be free from our sins. We want to be a kingdom of priests to God. I want you to take a close look at what God is preparing for us. One of these days, friends, you're going to be changed in a way that is even more of a radical change than you have experienced thus far. One of these days, we're going to be resurrected and we're going to be in the presence of God Almighty. John saw the Lord in all of his glory and power. When John beheld him, he said his countenance was glowing with the glory of God. You need to know that believers, are you a believer this morning? Amen. Believers are going to have fellowship with the glorified Christ. One of these days, we will walk with him, not on streets like these, but we're going to walk on streets of glory. We're going to walk in the presence of God. We're going to walk in the presence of him who is resurrected and standing in the glory of God. Revelation 1 and verse 17, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me and he said, don't, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and of grave. You need to know this today, that that's what the Lord has planned for you. If you've started walking with Jesus, you may not have known this when he called you out. When he said, I want you. When he, you know, you're saved because the Lord called you. 
You're saved because he claimed you. Amen. You're saved because he made a way. When those first disciples, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, started walking with the Lord, they were ready to forsake everything for the Lord. But they did not know what they were walking into. Now, all the way in the book of Revelation, John is standing in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Glory. And he's beholding Jesus in all of his glory. You see, this is what God has in plan for every one of you. When he, you started out, you did not know everything that he had planned. But he has loved you and he has claimed you. Yes, amen. Jump to slide 37, Paul. He says, they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.